have something to tell you. I found out why Jim shaved his beard, and we're gonna discuss it today on Rumors on WebDM. I can hear you. I can hear you everything. So Jim, <laughs> yeah. first off, who's starting all these rumors? Oh. And, and like, how do they get started? I mean, you know, that's the problem because you know when you deal with a situation like this and there's too many rumors, you know, it undermines people's trust, and you just you got a situation where everybody's just gonna have to start all over. You might as well burn the whole thing to the ground. Um, what? D and D? Wait, no, no, we're talking about D and D. We're talking about D and D. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like the public trust is eroded exactly. to the point. Of <laughs> what are the rumors and accusations? Um, the rumors. Rumors are a uh, a tool for the dungeon master to deliver information to the players. Like I, at their base level, the use yeah. of rumors in an RPG are the dungeon master signaling to the players, "I am prepared to do something about this." This is a thing that I at least have something prepared for, have an idea of, am ready to go with, or it is a tidbit of setting information that it might just be fun to have, yeah. or something to plant in your mind for, say, later on, like yeah. you know, five or six levels down uh, the campaign. So they're, they are a classic sort of tool for the dungeon master getting the information out there, but as the style of play in which they originated in has fallen out of favor and people stop sort of playing in the sandbox, hex crawl kind of open-ended world uh, and more towards the the big damn quest adventure path model uh, which was a long transition blah 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 whatever is they, they sort of feel vestigial kind of like wandering monster tables or other kinds of uh, you know artifacts from the early days of the hobby it is one of those things where because they've gotten misused or they're not used in the context of the games that they're most appropriate for or because like DMs have just not used them well. They, they don't craft <laughs> you know, yeah. useful rumor tables. They don't deliver the information to players in a way that's like helpful. It, it, mm -hmm. A lot of times you just you get a rumor or two when you start the game and then that's it. it, it there's nothing you know you never follow up with them. It's not it doesn't have an impact. Um, right why because would you do this you know exactly because like they don't have to be all true, certainly. but yeah. there needs to be a nugget of info so that you're constantly expanding your world yeah. in some way. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 certainly. And I, yeah, I don't think they, I think like the truth and veracity of them is, is it really is a function of how much BS your players will tolerate and misinformation will tolerate, that they'll tolerate you feeding them before they're just like, all right, we're never gonna act on anything mm -hmm. that, uh, that you give us. Um, that's one thing, but like, they are always there as a vehicle for saying something about the world. So like, even right. if a rumor is false, I think it should have some truth to it or some truth adjacent lore or information or something so that the players can at least go like, all right, well, this part of the rumor is false, but we this this part seems to be based on truth. Maybe we can investigate that and see what the real, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's really going on here. And so in that sense, they are what drive uh, sandbox play. You know, in, in the classic sense, the DM prepares a big, list of rumors for, say, the dungeon that they've uh, prepared or the wilderness environment that they've prepared. And it's a way of, one of the ways of telling the players, like, hey, there's a tower full of, you know, ghouls out there somewhere that you can, uh, you know, go claim their ancient treasures for. Or there's a nest of a wyvern that's attacking caravans or something like that. Can you go clear it out? And so in, in that sense, they are there to kind of signal, these are the quests, this is what's available, and here's a bit of tidbit about the world. Um, I, I just find myself, like, <laughs> usually when I see them in uh, kind of a mainstream RPG book or, or at a table, they're just not really well developed and they're not used to their full potential. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of that relies on how players react to them and how yeah. the players interact with the information they're given. So, like, like you said, uh, this kind of style of play has fallen out of favor. Yeah, um, yeah. And you, you've talked about how they can be, they can signal information or, or quests, but like behind the screen, like how do you formulate your rumors mm. and and kind of organize them? So I used to be a writing consultant for uh, helping people write uh, various kind of academic uh, essays, and what we'd always say is like, get your middle first. Like, what are you going to talk about in this subject? What are we really going to dive into? And like you should have an idea of what you're going to put into your introduction and your conclusion and everything, but like 
it's okay to go back and say rewrite your introduction because it no longer fits the body that you wrote. And right. so in a similar way, like a rumor is the introduction to the body of the adventure that mm -hmm. you've prepared. And so you, you can start with a rumor and then create the adventure that's going to accompany it around it. Or you can just create the adventures you'd like to have available for the party. You know, in a, in a classic, uh, you know, D&D &D game, you know, prepared according to the, you know, first edition DMG, you create a village, a home base, and then there's a central dungeon that gets used as sort of the default mode of play until that, uh, the players outgrow it, usually. Mm -hmm. they, they either just grow bored of, of dungeon delving and want to see what the surrounding wilderness is like, or, um, you know, if you're using the rules, the wilderness is way more dangerous than the dungeon. Right. <laughs> you know, and oh, yeah. you're, you're, the dungeon is more like the training grounds. It's where you gear up, level up, you know, get the status, reputation, and the like uh, to attract the followers you need to roam around the wilderness. Uh, and in order to find the most effective means of doing that, rumor tables tell you where the treasure is in the dungeon. Mm -hmm. They tell you what kind of monsters you might face, what sort of threats are there, uh, what other groups have gone through that might be able to uh, give you more information if you seek them out. Uh, they might be able to tell you about locations in the wilderness that either lead to other levels of the dungeon or other dungeons entirely. Like, it's, it's there to uh, have a more naturalistic and organic flow of the information as opposed to the DM just going like, all right guys, I'm, I, you know, I finished level three uh, last night and uh, if you guys, <laughs> you know, you can go do that or there's this other tower dungeon, you know, that I built. And you know, it's just a way to help maintain immersion. Yeah, instead of just talking about the, how you want to play tonight, <laughs> like yeah. away from character. Away from character, yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's also fun to, to explore those things in game. And so as I'm crafting my rumor tables, I will almost always start with like, all right, what do I have prepared, uh, you know, and immediately that the players could interact with? Uh, and whether that's like, I've got three hooks in more the, you know, using more of the classic terminology of the plot hook or three adventure locations or whatever it is. Uh, usually taking those and extrapolating as much of the interesting things that I've put in there and turning them into a rumor. So mm -hmm. in a way you're kind of playing a game of telephone with yourself. <laughs> you right, know? yeah. Uh, and you can, you can uh, facilitate that by just time, you know, write, write down your initial thought, uh, create the adventure, and then let it sit for a while, go back and reread it, all right, what kind of strikes you about it that's maybe not 100% true, but true enough. Mm -hmm. um, and so if I'm doing like a mega dungeon campaign, for instance, <clears throat> then I might have 10 to 20 rumors per level. And they might be rumors about secret places inside that level. What kind of threats are there? What sort of treasures there? What's the history of the place? All of these things, whether they are true or not, are going to be useful. And that's the point. That their truth is, eh, I, use, I like a two-thirds to one-third true to false ratio. Uh, I, more true than not, uh, just because of player trust and the like. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they should always be useful. And yeah, in yeah. that sense, I try to break down the, the individual rumors into category. Is this a rumor that's gonna be useful for fighter types? Is this a rumor that's gonna be good for mage types or cleric types? Or is this gonna be good for, for characters of a certain background, travelers and wanderers, or people who are more like homebodies, like guild artisans and the like, mm -hmm. kind of stick close around. Um, dividing up rumor tables by social class is also another fun way to do it. So, oh yeah, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna have whole <laughs> separate levels between the nobility and the peasants. Absolutely, right? in a product like say uh, City State of the Invincible Overlord from Judges Guild, the beggars were sort of the, the main vector for rumors, such that the beggars had formed a guild amongst themselves, a mutual protection society, uh, in which they share information with each other and mm -hmm. coordinate what kind of information would be available. And you always know, you can just approach a beggar, toss a few uh, coins to him, and, and get the uh, local news. Uh, yeah, it's like John Wick shit. <laughs> yeah, like, right, yeah. You know, <laughs> the, beg the beggar king and his freaking arm yeah. army of... Yeah. of oh. <laughs> and they're at war with the Assassin's Guild and a lot of other things. So um, it, it, there's that. There's town criers uh, and, and heralds and things like that, more, more official mm -hmm. uh, means. There's notice boards, mm -hmm. job boards. Like, it's a cliched thing, but oh, it's... Yeah cliched because it's super convenient <laughs> or, or just the cliche of the bartender <laughs> right because yeah. everyone comes in and spills their troubles after getting off the road yeah and that gets translated to the next 
it gets sure translated that comes along. to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and yeah, the, the idea of a coaching in a medieval world is way acronistic, blah, blah, blah. In this case, we're, we're not talking about simulating a particular medieval society or something. We're talking about disguising a game mechanic just enough Mm -hmm. So that it's palatable, doesn't break immersion too much, and then getting it to the uh, getting it to the players. So um, a place like an inn, like a crossroads of a lot of uh, you know roads or something. It's not in a big city or the like. It's it's a way to get to those rumors for say wilderness adventures or whatever. But it's also a way to like combine a lot of these types. So it's like maybe there's a traveling aristocrat uh, and their entourage and they've got a different set of concerns and rumors. They've heard different things, yeah, yeah. you know, but it's like they're aristocrats. So they're plugged into the movement of kings and other aristocrats. If you're wanting to know if it's okay to go to another country or to go to another place on the map, they might be more apt to know about that than say the local peasants who are gonna know a lot more about local concerns and folklore and what yeah. the local legends are, things like oh, that. Oh yeah, the raiders uh, over the next hill or that yeah. one dungeon that everybody talks about to the east. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's the, where is the hermit druid we can get to help us with this rare disease? They might know, you know, yeah. they, they have them come around their farms once or twice a year to bless the fields, mm -hmm. um, you know, something like that. Or like there's a mercenary company in town and oh, you got some players with like soldier or mercenary backgrounds then you can sort of like tie that in. Maybe they share news with each other, job opportunities, or where the latest uh, you know, captains are hiring for a new campaign. Collecting these tidbits of information, you create a fuller picture of your world, but you're also signaling to the players, like if you guys don't have anything you wanna do, there's always this stuff. Whether you pick it up or not is, you know, it's up to the player, but you're signaling that it is available. There is a game available, there are yeah. things to do, adventure to be had. And that's why I really like using them. Well, yeah, because they aren't they aren't specifically quests, but they are right. right. Like yeah, whether yeah, or not they're true or mm -hmm. the version of them. That's why, I like, uh, like we talk about The Witcher all the time, sure, and yeah. how it's like the peasants' rumors about monsters yes. <laughs> are almost always wrong. <laughs> right. But there is a monster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Those that that false information comes from a a real encounter misinterpreted, yeah. right, or, or something like that. Yeah. And I think like there's you know if you're if you're Dealing with players who don't necessarily, you know, aren't used to taking the reins and investigating leads on their own initiative and and the like, then there's there can be kind of a push and pull of, of am I dragging them by this hook <laughs> or yeah. did they take the bait, uh, as it were, or are they pursuing something that they are legitimately interested in? Um, I, you know, for me, the litmus test is always, do people seem like they're enjoying themselves and do they show up week after week? Mm -hmm. If, if the answer is yes to one or both, then that's good enough for me. So these things are there to let them let other players know, like, hey, you don't have to sit here twiddling your thumbs. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that sense, a rumor should compel action. Whether it is an actual, like, a rumor that suggests a full quest, like, oh, the sword of whatever has gone missing was last seen, uh, you know, on this stretch of road, that's a quest. That yeah. sword's not gonna be in that region for very long. It, it's, it, it's sort of time bound. It has an objective. It, it, there's an implied sort of, we could go do this thing. Or it could just be, you know, there are bandits on the high road. That could easily be a rumor as well. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, I also find that uh, a session zero is good for compiling rumors and also secrets. Like I like to do a rumor and secret table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I like for the players to give them to me because sure. why do all the heavy lifting when you're yeah. literally at a table with a brain trust? Sure, sure, yeah. And and so you come up with, because for me, rumors, it's like a 50-50. Yeah. Whether it's completely true or it leads to something, but it's kind of off like we were talking about. Whereas a secret, it's a truth about the world, but only very few people know. Right. But you can let them give them to you and then change them just enough based on what everybody gives you to give yeah. them right back. Because yeah. then that player like goes, oh, that's the thing that I know, and they're yeah. more apt to like latch yeah. on to it because you're now using something that they've invested. Yeah, right? yeah, and, and having, yes, and Session Zero is another great resource for like filling out a rumor table and like, because you can get that information from the people themselves, from yeah. the players. What do you guys like to do in a game? What are your what are your play styles? Mm -hmm. If you've got a bunch of people who want a more investigative, intrigue style game, then you know that those are the kinds of rumors that you will want to put on there. Yeah. And maybe instead of everybody having rumors about what travelers are going on, everybody has little tiny secrets that they know. They got the dirt on someone. And and so whereas a traditional, say, urban campaign is navigating different factions and the like, this is more about like can I get these secrets that these NPCs have? 
they've all got something in them. They all know something no one else does. They all have dirt on someone else or blackmail or whatever it is. And the job of the PCs then is to uh, trade in and acquire secrets. And that is a very different campaign than one that's based around rumors of gold in the dungeon and yeah. goblins in the hills and things like that. But yeah. it's the, you know more or less the same thing. Oh know? yeah, totally. Like that's it, yeah. It's, but it does it can drive slightly different ways of playing. Yeah, I, I want to stick with what you were talking about though because mm -hmm. I do like the idea of getting the players' input for these things because ultimately what the tool of the rumor table is is a way of in generating and 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 facilitating player engagement with the world. Mm -hmm. And the traditional model of the DM creates everything themselves, you know, without really a lot of input from the players until, at least until play starts. Uh, that's one way of doing it. But you can really, <laughs> you can really make it more effective if you seed mm -hmm. that table or whatever you're doing. Uh, you don't have to roll on it randomly, but if you seed those uh, bits of information with things that you know the players are gonna want. Yeah. And and in that sense, it's a it's an aspect of sort of like positive metagaming. Oh yeah, uh, you know, uh, for for myself, I you know I had uh, some players who I I knew that I um, you know one of them wanted to go to a particular city for like a reputation for being a, a terrible place, a city of the dead. I wanted to make sure that there were enough of the the party that had. Uh, complementary interests mm -hmm. to get them there. And so I know some of the, the players wanted to go there just because they wanted to as players. They wanted to have this game experience. And some people wanted to go there because their characters were interested in going there. And so then it was just a matter of, of finding reasons and, and rumors and just whatever for those particular uh, PCs so that they have what they need. <laughs> they have the excuse that they need and the mm -hmm. motivation that they need to seek this out. And, and this is when, to me, this is like where the rubber meets the road when we talk about how a player-driven game with where the players have a lot of very strong goals that they are pursuing and the dungeon master is facilitating that and also creating a living world can look like a linear campaign. Like mm -hmm. this is sort of where the rubber meets the road on it because you're taking their information, crafting something that you know they're going to be interested in, but it's with a twist. There's surprises still. Yeah. And uh, you know, then you present it to them. They pursue it, and then the closer and closer you get to that thing, the more and more detail you've added. Hence, this sort of living, breathing, amazing campaign. Well, yeah. I mean, it is kind of a railroad, but it's one that they built the track. Yeah. And yeah. they built the train. Sure. You're just giving them shit. Like you're just throwing damsels in distress across the railroads. Right. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, and that's fine because that's if it's fine. again, it's player driven. It's player driven. They're the yeah. conductor. Yeah. But doing that in a session zero, I think it just fosters so much more player investment. Yeah. When they're giving you the things that you are now giving back to them, yeah. like it just makes it makes your world seem mu that much more alive because it's not just them picking a background and oh I'm I'm a soldier. Yeah. Well, it's like well how long were you on campaign? You sure certainly heard some stuff. Right. Yeah, and so yeah. from the beginning, there are things that their character knows, mm -hmm. and that when they hear just a bit of it, they can be like oh wait I I was there on that yeah. ridge yeah. when that happened. No, 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 to the east, yeah, that's where we need to go. I remember this. Yeah. Because yeah, you're yeah. giving them just a little bit more of that same secret that they yeah. gave you. And like you said, you know, you just give them just enough to drive play further down the road mm -hmm. of their own choosing. Do that. And yeah, then you start mixing it up with the other players' goals. You say, like, you know, you start combining things. The rumor is enough to get two or three of the PCs interested mm -hmm. uh, in going. And, they, and you're taking that, and you're also seeding it with things that they didn't ask for at all. They're just like, what you want to put in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are, and then the third sort of category thing to put in there is just like news, just stuff. What, what's oh, yeah. going on in the world? Uh, and and what I find is is is, is giving them the information is, uh, is is important, but also just like not having these things hinge on um, something that's unpredictable or unreliable. If there's a rumor you want them to have, then you just go, "This is a rumor you guys heard." You know, and yeah. there's plenty of times where, especially after downtime, where I will just say, "Okay, you guys had a month of downtime. You know, whatever. While while that, the, here's some of the news from the rest of the world. Here's what you've heard around town. Uh, and then if they want to know more, they can go inquire about it. Um, but it's just kind of one of those things where I like to every few sessions just toss something new in there, toss something uh, that that I think they're going to enjoy. Particularly if this is one where it's specifically been crafted and presented from player feedback." Mm -hmm. You know, this is one of those things where it's like, all right, you guys said you wanted to do this thing with mermaids. 
<laughs> here, yeah. you know, here are some rumors <laughs> about that. That's one of the ways in which I find you can bridge that gap between the kind of sandbox game that a lot of people complain about, which is one, and no pun intended, very dry, kind of featureless. Of course. Of course. <laughs> you know, and the, the players sort of twiddle their thumbs. They don't know what to do. The dungeon master feels like they've got to prepare like everything. They don't know what's going to happen. Uh, that's a that's a bad sandbox. Like that's yeah. that's probably not going to be a lot. Of, that's probably not going to be sustainable or very fun. Yeah, some kitties probably use that as a little bit of box. Right. Yes. <laughs> you're going we'll to find some, you're gonna find some shit. If you've got one where it's say smaller, more manageable, you're not prepping more than you need, and you've got players who are engaged and running, then yeah, this is this is like one of the better tools out there for it because it's so versatile and and. Just so many different ways that you can get this information to the players that you really can bring your setting to life. It's really fun. Most definitely. So uh, f for you, whenever you, you've created all these, who do you, like, who stands to gain from these rumors, right? Mm. Like, are you worried more about your big villains and how that's disseminated? Or are you worried, like, sometimes, like, the PCs take it upon themselves to start rumors, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And, like, how, like, the interplay of that. Yeah, tr tr elevating it from more than just the the tool of like this is my list of plot hooks cleverly disguised to mm -hmm. you no know, these things represent moving parts of a living world. If, right. If there are rumors of military activity in this area or rumors of a magical artifact in this area, why do you think the PCs are the only ones that know about them? And this is one of those things where if you've got rival adventuring parties, if if the party has not villains that they oppose, but rival, you know, just rivals. Antagonists. Antagonists, yeah. foils and the like. Um, these are great sort of... Heels. <laughs> yeah, <Sorry. laughs> great ways to <laughs> introduce them yeah. as ways for them to get involved in the campaign while they're still in the background. They're mm -hmm. not hogging the spotlight from the players. They're not taking up game time. But you can be like, oh yeah, the Company of the Raven, the rival adventurers that formed just to oppose you because they like individually don't like each one of you. Uh, you know, they each seize the staff of, of power. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> your mirror universe, uh, uh, you know, darkest timeline uh, parties have, have uh, gone off and done something rash. A sect of goat worshiping. <laughs> never mind. I was going to make a go I was going to make a goatee joke, but never mind. Y'all see where it was going. Yeah. Uh, but it can also be things like if you do run, if you run like an open table where there's multiple groups of PCs that are playing in the same world and you're just sort of like, all right, well, this group's over here doing this and this group's over there doing that. Rumor tables are a nice way to like get that information exchanged in an in-character sense. Yeah, between the two. Yeah. Yeah. But it is like, you know, if, if the rumors say represent the demands of the local aristocracy, if part of the rumor is, you know, is that there's too many horse thieves going around and mm -hmm. gotta go catch those horse thieves or whatever, and nobody does that, then that should have an impact on the campaign. If the players try to acquire horses, they should be, be more expensive. expensive. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> right? if, if the players like actively turned it down to someone and it's like become a problem for that NPC, then maybe that NPC is going to be like, no, you guys didn't help me when I needed it. Uh, or, or something like that. And that's where you switch from, that's the transition from like rumor to quest. Once the players act on it, to me, that's when it becomes a quest. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, whether they just investigate it a little bit and then never come back to it or, or you know, see it all the way through, um, it's, it's, had a, it's had a brush with the players. <laughs> Therefore, it is now a, uh, an element of the game. It, it's, it's got a place at the table. Who benefits from them? Gosh, you could have like old, you know, old adventurers come out of retirement that, mm -hmm. uh, to deal with uh, you know, a bunch of problems. Or you could have, um, you know, like I said, villains and rivals. Uh, you know, if, if the rumor tables are a lot about like treasure or magic items or power, then those are things that the potential villains of your campaign know about as well. Yeah. And if the players sit on the information that an unlooted tomb of one of the ancient sorcerer kings is out there and it's just sort of been discovered and they meander their way to it and get distracted by a lot of stuff and yeah, happen they're, to... They're, they're playing The Witcher 3 and they do all the side quests. They do quests. all the side quests <laughs> yeah. and everything like that. Yeah. You know? And part of being a player is recognizing when you are pursuing a side quest and recognizing when you are pursuing something that's time bound and should take top priority and recognize when you're pursuing something that is optional and you can yeah. put this on pause, right? right. Uh, as it were. And, and that's part of the skill of, of, of playing in an open world. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, yeah, you, they might show up at that 
tomb of the Sorcerer King and it's in the midst of being looted or already looted yeah, or yeah. partially looted and now the inhabitants and guardians are super angry. Right, or, right. You know, or they got there first, despite all odds. Like, combining rumors with uh, an idea of how long it takes for things to happen and what the NPCs of your world do when the players aren't engaged with them and finding quick and easy ways to keep track of all that is part of how you create a living world. Yeah, yeah. and that's incumbent completely on the DM. I mean, yeah, because yeah. you have to refresh your rumor table, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely refreshing your rumor table. So keeping it up to date, keeping it like, uh, keeping it fresh is one of those things that I think makes it a living world and, mm -hmm. and uh, especially if you're including things like news from afar, which is a, a tip that I got from the Hill Cantons blog, uh, it, which is just a really uh, cool old school blog that has a lot of good information on it. And one of the things that the DM there does uh, for his home campaign is this news from afar. Mm -hmm. And every few sessions, it's yeah. like, here's what's going on in the wide world. It might have no bearing on the campaign at all. But it's like an old newsie. <laughs> it's like an old newsie. It, it, like, Meanwhile some, in the fall realm. <laughs> sometimes they really read like, here are the campaigns as I, here are the other campaigns I would be willing to run. Yeah. <laughs> and there are, have been times when I have done that uh, in a game where I've been like, the rumors here are, if you guys aren't enjoying this one, I could run these. <laughs> this right is also going on in the world. To bring it back down to sort of like the, the level of, of how it interacts, how you create a living world out of it. Let's say that, uh, you know, in your first session, you hand out 10 rumors, two per PC or something like that. And they follow up on four of them. You know, they, they, they end up getting to four of them and they get back to civilization or there's a bit of downtime in the campaign and maybe one of them asks, hey, whatever happened to that one thing? You know, whatever, that seemed like it was important. Could we still go and do, investigate that? And, you know, for the longest time, I would just either, you know, in the rare instances that, that happened, I just sort of decide on the spot of the moment. But now I like using the, uh, the 2D6 table, which we've talked about before, uh, to sort of just roll on it and, and see what the oracle of the dice tell me mm -hmm. about what's going on in my world. And uh, in that sense, the refresher for the 2D6 table, um, 2D6 produces a result 2 through 12, obviously a nice little bell curve. Um, and two is usually the worst result, <laughs> you know, just yeah. like absolute, the worst thing you could want to happen. Whereas 12 is obviously the best. And then the categories there can be broken down many different ways, but I like five categories that represent two and then three through five, which is sort of like, eh, you don't want this. Uh, six through eight, which is sort of a neutral result. Uh, nine through 11, which is usually like a good result. And then 12, which is the best. And so I look at it like this is say, this is a rumor that was never followed up on. Roll the 2d6, do I get a two? And that means this rumor was either followed up on and was a disaster. <laughs> okay, know? so let me, yeah. so like say your rumor is uh, an object of power, uh, there's supposedly in this, dun in this tower over here, there's an object of power, but it's guarded by bugbears. Yeah, yeah. So what would your response, your results be on your 2d6 So the 2d6, so, so for well, going through each of the categories there, for the two, it would be like, yeah, a group attempted an expedition to recover it and uh, was slaughtered and in the process of it stirred up the bugbears who are now actively recruiting other humanoids to and retaliate. Their, and their ranks are growing. And yeah, their ranks are growing. Yeah, They're yeah. using that object that they had. Whereas if it was a three through five, just sort of like uh, that, for rumors, that becomes a false rumor. There was no staff of power there. Right. There was just some bugbears. Just some bugbears. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. Um, and then the six through eight would just be, yeah, it's still there. There, nothing's happened. There's still a, uh, you know, rumor has it, yeah, that the, you know, fires have still been seen there, weird eldritch lights at night, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, if it was a 9 through 11, then it would be a confirmation of a truthful rumor. Yes, someone has been there, someone laid eyes on it. I've seen the staff, you know, our, our, we made an expedition, we didn't get very far, but we saw a shaman walking around with this item. And then if it was 12, that would be a rival adventuring party has cleared the place out, they got the thing. There's nothing there now, and I'd probably give it a few weeks before I rolled to see if something has moved into that location. And then I would add another rumor on there of just like, oh yeah, Sturges have moved into the old bugbear tower or something like that. Or a necromancer. Or a necromancer or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got plenty of soldiers. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, some other options for that might be like some of the, the worst results might be that there were just setbacks. You know, the, someone attempted to... Uh, to take the tower uh, and the like, and you know they dealt a grievous wound to the to the bugbears, but 
they, they didn't accomplish their goals. Right. You know, those, uh, or it could be that, oh yeah, they're in the middle of it. They, they attacked and, and uh, you know, they made good progress, but now the bugbears are in a stalemate. They're recruiting new mercenaries. Mm -hmm to go out there and help them. Now but they've been laying siege or something Right, like that. yeah, yeah. Now you're not the stars anymore, but you could still get in on the action. <laughs> you know, that you kind could, of thing. You could swoop in and save the day. <laughs> it's in that sense where once you've started building these things up, I, I think a lot of the, the pressure for like sandbox gaming and open world gaming is the feeling of like, you've got to do all of this work at, in, at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, and you got to do all of it, and I do not. Please don't, unless you're prepping something to sell. <laughs> you know, if you're going to sell me a, a giant hex crawl, then I, I expect it to be well stocked. Yeah, <laughs> but but uh, you know, if you're just preparing something for your players, you 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 don't need that much. You need what you need enough to know to maintain the coherence and the logic of your game. And you need enough prepared that when the players go, we do this, you've got something for them. That's why random tables, sample dungeons, all those kind of things exist to help you facilitate that. And the rumor table is just one of those things. And it's a nice way of signaling to the players, here are things that we could have a fun adventure with. You know? Like right now. Like right now. You mm -hmm. guys don't like sitting around twiddling your thumbs while I come up with an adventure. You don't like me rolling on random tables because you feel like it doesn't have significance to the campaign. You don't like there being things introduced that, that don't have connections to your characters. Then pick from this list of things that I have. That's literally what you're, uh, what yeah. you're doing. You're, so. at the rest <laughs> you're, you're at the RPG restaurant. Here's the menu, baby. Yeah. These are our specials. Uh, right, yeah. And, <laughs> and if you're going to use a list like that, then you owe it to yourself, your players, and your world to yeah. just do a little maintenance. It'd be beginning of every session just roll a couple of dice on the chart don't like the 2d6 roll a d20 roll a d10 d4 flip a coin put them on the wall and throw a dart and at it without <laughs> looking yeah you know it's it's it, you know it's a randomizer for your convenience mm -hmm. uh, and and a way to help simulate this uh a larger place and in that sense um i think it's a tool that's worth using right yeah and in the right context the right game uh they can be very powerful and really yeah. just fun <laughs> oh yeah, because if you, if you don't use them right, well then you know it's your player. You might get some rumors started. I was just saying, yeah, that's that's the sort of one, then we, once you have the players who are like, I'd like to put some rumors on that table myself. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and maybe they start whisper campaigns about rivals or mm -hmm. local nobles. Or, oh, that's oh, know. that's one of my favorite things in the Star Bound campaign. Elry used to do that shit all the time. He'd go into a bar and start a rumor in the corner and wait for it to work its way around the bar back to him, <laughs> so it would give him a reason to be like, what? Right. <laughs> You know, yeah. I mean, like, why not do that? Especially for an intrigue or a secrets-based game, like, having the players, and, you know, you can handle this as a downtime activity or, you know, however way you want, but having the players interact with the world in such a way that their mark shows up on yeah. these things. This is also why I like, uh, say, if we're running a dungeon crawl, like, <laughs> leaving my own minions in the dungeon as a player so that it's like, I want to be, I want my guys to be on the random encounter table. Yeah. You know, I want, They're going to hold this place I want we get my back. mercenaries on there. Yeah, I want some of these to be friendlies for me. Yeah. And it's the same with like a rumor table. I think it, as a player, or sorry, as a dungeon master, your willingness to have that level of interaction shows the players that like, they can shape this place. They can, mm -hmm. they can mold it. They're not just here to observe and ooh and ah. We are here to play with these toys. <laughs> right. You know, and... Uh, yeah. Well, and I think very, it's uh, and I think it's worth saying that even though we were talking about rumors, yeah, like in your world, that's just a synonym. It could be myth has it, legend mm. has it, legend local has it, tale yeah. has it. Yes. Like, but just rumor is kind of an all-encompassing thing that it's like it could be or it couldn't be, which is why I kind of like rumors versus secrets. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Truthful kind of versus <laughs> like you're not really sure. It's kind of gray. It could be kind of gray. Yeah. yeah. Think, uh, rumor is just a sort of stand-in for any any nuggets of information. Right. Right. The key. Here here is that they are actionable. They are gameable. Yeah. And, e and, and even if it's like lore that you're distributing, it's lore that, it, that is adjacent to the gameable things. Mm -hmm. So they are either directly things that players can act on and do something about, or information that will help the players make a decision. Right. But, and if, it's, if it's not one of those two things, then you're really kind of doing yourself a disservice with this tool. You're coming up, you're yeah. just writing prose for no reason at that point, because I used yeah. to do that all the time, because I wanted to be like, well, not everything's true, sure. and so I'd give some bullshit, Yeah. and yeah. then I realized later on, it's like, well, now they don't really trust the now things they don't I trust say, the information. Yeah. and it's not useful, so right. they're not listening to the thing that I'm telling them. Yeah. So learning, like you said, to make it an actual bit of info, or at least, oh, Helpful, wait, yeah. 
that rumor that we heard about the wizard loving fire doesn't really matter except let's prepare for fire traps yes. and whatever while yeah. we're in the dungeon. Yeah, yeah. It's not really a wizard. It's someone else or it's not really... Yeah, a, yeah but it's, it's not the, really yeah. a wizard, but they use Something fire still. There, yeah. Something yeah. there that they can use. And, th and that's really it. And in that sense, you know, the, it, it really gets to the heart of like what gaming and, and role playing is about, which is the exchange of information. The DM comes up with a bunch of secrets and stuff and arranges it in a certain order, presents it to the players, and most of the action of a session is the exchange of information. Mm -hmm. And so I've gotten to the point now where when I create rumor tables and the like, I have the information and then I have a vector. Yeah. So that it is so that I have a way of you know mixing and matching as the game or as the game gets played. To me, that was sort of the next level of rumor table for me was thinking in terms of the information and vector because vectors could be particular type of NPCs, mm -hmm. and it could be that only some types of rumors are available to certain NPC. You know, like for instance, the king is the one who knows about kingly matters or something like that. Oh yeah, like we were saying with aristocrats versus like. Peasants, peasants and, and beggars yeah. and the like, yeah. So it might be in, useful to think of things in terms of like, like we were saying earlier, their social standing. If you've got a, you know, a rumor table that is divided by social standing, then you maybe also have uh, a number of, uh, <laughs> you know, quick NPCs that uh, that could be used to uh, to come up with this stuff. So like a toothless old woman on the street selling. Uh, uh, you know, sweet rolls told me about this one thing. Oh, well, oh, I she's heard. A yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> You've trained me. Yeah, you trained. Yeah, everybody gets trained for it. Uh, no, she's just a sweet. She just doesn't have teeth because they didn't have good dental practice. Because <laughs> she eats a lot of sweets. <laughs> she's a lot of that's sweets. That's really it. <laughs> You are what you eat, right? It. Or maybe it's like you know a meeting of the uh, the guildsmen who are uh, you know having their their annual banquet or something. And well, their rumors and what gets passed around there is going to be a lot different than, say, at, you know, at the the flea market outside of town. So thinking in terms of like their social status, uh, where they stand in kind of the city or, or society that they're a part of. Uh, backgrounds is another one. What soldiers know are going to be very different than what sages know, what entertainers know, what acolytes know. Mm -hmm. um, that, and if we're talking like purely D&D 5th edition, that's probably where I would start, is oh, the yeah. backgrounds. Um, but then when you start thinking about it, there's a lot of fun things you can do with, with rumors and information that don't involve the traditional buy an NPC around. It's things like, what do your animals know? What do the animals in your setting know? How yeah. could they pass on some of this info? You know, even barbarians, barbarians can talk to animals, <laughs> right? some of them. Yeah, some of them can, you know, and, <laughs> and, and moreover, it's just like, it, what if they're just, what if the animals just came up and talked to the PCs without there needing to be a speak with animals, just because some animals can speak more languages than we think, you know? <laughs> yeah. They're, you know, why, <laughs> here's the, all right, here's the, I'll, as a brief aside, in our own world, in medieval Europe and the like, they thought regular ass animals had magic powers. Yeah. Like it's not they they didn't make a distinction between monsters, animals, and and the like. They were just all out there, and so I, I do like I'm a big fan of taking ordinary animals and imbuing them with magical powers in D and D. Well, I mean, especially like animal like ravens or parrots that can ravens. literally talk. Sure. Like yeah. imagine like being in the fucking dark ages and ravens start repeating <laughs> what you say, and sure. you're like, yeah. Are, are you possessed by something? Oh, right, yeah, yeah. You sure. know. What, should I be careful about what I say around you? Maybe. Maybe Did my son to. pass away and his spirit is now in that raven that right. we leave? <laughs> right, you know? yeah, yeah, exactly. Because he says the thing that my son used to always say. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of different uh, a lot of different ways, you know, animal symbolism, delivering certain, uh, certain things. Depending on the level of uh, magical ambiance in your game, it could be that plants and rocks and and other things are able to contribute mm -hmm. uh, to these uh, rumor tables. Or the, uh, 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 like Dark Souls. Yes, sort of just uh, like the ghosts messages, of others, or the messages, messages yeah. left behind and shit. Messages left behind. I, I mean, the idea of like there being messages left behind in a dungeon, like dungeon graffiti or, or warnings from previous expeditions, uh, thieves signs in a city, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing is probably everywhere. Like, what does this mean? How does this work? Uh, yeah. You know, ranger signs in the wilderness are another one. Druid and ranger uh, glyphs. Because we write on everything. You write on everything. You know, when we dug up Pompeii, a lot of archaeologists wanted to bury that shit because it was all just <laughs> 
just like <laughs> dirty, you know, like dirty propaganda, like so and so sleeps with so and so. Right. You oh, know, man. dungeon graffiti is yeah. one of my favorite things to include in a dungeon. You're just like, because you can have it be like monster graffiti. They can reveal like where secret doors are if they're written in code. And yeah, the spell comprehend languages breaks a lot of this, but you know, I, I, either you la let it or come up with a way that it doesn't work uh, with yeah. these. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, yeah. like, it, wait, does does comprehend languages break ciphers or is it just language? I think it's just, it, yeah, this because is that's where, how this you because to me that's yeah. how you break that. It's in a cipher. I don't think that comprehend comprehend languages should break ciphers just because I think that's a bit much for a first level spell. Yeah. Well, um, the fact so, yeah. that it can comprehend any language is already a lot. Yeah, already a lot. Yeah. If the uh, information conveyed by written uh, signs and the like was going to be super important to my game. Similar to uh, something with like locks. If I was gonna have a lot of lock picking and it was gonna be a strong feature, then I might do more than just like, a, you know, a thieves tools roll. It might be that, you know, different locks require different things. Same with glyphs and writing and ciphers mm -hmm. and the like. You know, it's like maybe you need comprehend languages just to start unlocking this thing. Yeah, just so you know the words. Just so you know now you gotta words. figure out what now the words actually out. mean, yeah. mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's a great way to disseminate rumors in a non, you know, verbal yeah, uh, way. Yeah, yeah. What's in the environment that can clue you in? And once you start thinking of things like that, then tracks, traces, and the like, those are all parts of a quote unquote rumor table. And they all have different functions, they all have different uh, information that they can convey. But if the PCs are out to investigate sightings of a particular nasty monster, then making sure that you've included enough variety in the number of signs and tracks and traces of where this monster might be so that you can have all that information and have it come out naturally and organically as opposed to like, oh yeah, there's a dragon over here in these hills and you make a survival roll. All right, you walk right to it. Let's get started. Yeah. Like you can, but that cuts out a lot of uh, interesting and engaging uh, parts of the game. If you like the video, please like, subscribe, and go ahead and ring that bell to get those notifications. The Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the, the Web Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, head on over to our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. The crazy thing is when that first picture got posted, like I vague, only like the vaguest notion of a memory of you without facial hair. Yeah. And like, I, cause we went to high school together. We didn't really like hang out at that time, but we hung out like yeah. literally with the same people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so it was just one of those things of just like, I remember kind of, but I saw that picture, I'm like, who the fuck is that? Yeah, yeah. And then I had yeah. to like take my thumb and cover your kind bottom of, half yeah. of your face. And I'm like, oh, it's Jim. Yeah, the first you time know. I was a live stream and I wore a bandana because <laughs> everybody, I didn't want to freak everybody out. So yeah, if you guys see with different arrangements of facial, it, it's fine, I'm still a man, I, I still am the same person. Beard does not control me, I control the beard. Yeah, and, damn right you do. Uh, and it's okay, I know some people feel threatened by the loss of a beard, uh, that's that's not no. my problem. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can always buy a scarf if your face gets cold. Sure, I, you know, it gives you the option of buying like a prosthetic beard, you know, like I can get like one of those yarn beards. You get a, <laughs> the beard that you want, uh, yeah, not the one that is not the one upon nature me. gave me. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I'm I'm at the limit right now. Like uh, my hairs have turned in on my face uh -huh. and are currently clawing my face every moment of the day. Yeah, and so I'm I want to shave it this happens. so bad. Yeah, but I'm doing it for y'all. <laughs> he does. He makes just, sacrifices just, for you guys.